What you are seeing here is the real flying saucer, the Avrocar, designed by British engineer John Frost in the 1950s, in a partnership involving Canadians and North Americans. Although the idea of these saucer-shaped aircraft was already present in pop culture at the time, it was the growing interest in VTOL aircraft, an acronym for Vertical Takeoff and Landing, that led the military to the Avrocar program. At this time of the Cold War, there was the certainty that any new major conflict on the European continent would start with nuclear attacks that would eliminate the main military installations, such as the airstrips. This scenario led to the need for VTOL aircraft that could take off and land without the need for long runways and position troops and weapons behind enemy lines with relative speed and safety. This was already possible with the most important VTOL aircraft in operation at that time, the helicopter, which would even be the primary means of transporting troops in the Vietnam War in the 60s. But despite the excellent performance of this aircraft, the heated Cold War was boosting many projects that went beyond the already successful helicopter. Let's just say that the minds and wallets of the military were open to the most creative and exotic projects that could come along, like Aerocycle and the Avrocar flying saucer. They were looking for something more than the helicopter could not offer, an aircraft that could operate both as a helicopter and as a fighter with supersonic speed, capable of shooting down Soviet bombers, something that Avrocar promised to fulfill. John Frost was an experienced British engineer and military aircraft designer who had worked on various projects of this kind in England. In 1947, he moved to Canada to work on the first Canadian fighter, the CF-100 at Avro Canada. In 1952, Frost got initial funding from the Canadian government to develop an aircraft that was unlike anything that existed until then, and that would explore the combination of two very interesting physical phenomena, the Kawanda effect and the ground effect. Briefly, the Kawanda effect is the tendency of a fluid to stay attached to a curved convex surface. It is a phenomenon that is not only used to annoy you, but is extremely important in aviation and motorsports, for example. On the other hand, the ground effect is an aerodynamic effect where the airflow around a body is influenced by the ground, as seen with an airplane's wings or the helicopter's rotor blades. This creates a high pressure cushion of air between the aircraft and the ground, increasing lift. This effect would prove to be the most significant in the Avrocar project. The aircraft that intended to utilize these physical phenomena was this curious saucer-shaped aircraft, known as the Y2 or MX 1794 project. In an initial model of the project, it was envisioned that six turbojet engines would be used to generate a large flow of gases in the center and around the aircraft, harnessing the ground effect to create an air cushion that would enable it to hover. In these designs, we can see that the exhausts of the six jet engines would be utilized to power a large central turbine and generate lift in the center of the aircraft. However, this turbine would also have two sections that would use a portion of its kinetic energy to draw in air through two intakes, one located on the top and another on the bottom of the aircraft. This air would be used to power the engines and generate additional lift in the outer ring. It would also be directed by control surfaces for lateral movements and to enable high-speed flight akin to a fighter jet, in theory at least. But despite this project being very innovative, it had already undergone major changes. The previous design would not use conventional jet engines to drive the central turbine. Instead, it featured a large turbojet engine designed by Frost, which was very different from existing jet engines. The engine stages were arranged in concentric rings with the compressor in the inner diameter, the combustion chamber in the middle, and the turbine in the outer diameter. It was a radial flow jet engine, a centrifugal flow engine, with the jet flow going from the inner ring to the outer ring, causing the jet thrust to exit from the entire outer ring of the engine. As for the Coanda effect, it would be used as one of the flight controls in both this design and another version with eight jet engines mounted with their exhaust facing the edge of the saucer. The idea was to use a controllable ring around the aircraft's edge to bend the jet flow from the engines. However, this concept was eventually abandoned, and the Kawanda effect lost relevance in subsequent designs. But when looking at this design, I can't help but imagine the noise it would create for the pilot being surrounded by eight jet engines positioned at the center. By the way, in this design the pilot would also be surrounded, not by engines, but by fuel tanks. This was done to maintain the center of gravity in the center of the aircraft. It was a design that posed a high and obvious risk to the pilots, and fortunately for them, it did not progress. 
One of the reasons was that the idea of having only one engine did not sit well with the Canadian military, as they argued that in case of engine failure, an emergency landing would be out of the question. But the main reason was that this innovative engine would be too expensive to develop, and the funding from the Canadian government was limited. This is why Frost changed the project to use commercially available turbojet engines, which would be cheaper and accelerate the prototype's construction, making it more robust. Speaking of money, the lack of it was a major problem, causing the project to progress slowly for a while, partly because various other projects were competing for the same funding. This led Frost to contact the military of the neighboring country, which had ample funds and two different branches of the armed forces to cater to. The Air Force was searching for a VTOL aircraft that could operate as a helicopter, taking off from places without airstrips and flying under enemy radar, and as a fighter, intercepting and engaging Soviet bombers at supersonic speeds. It's hard to imagine a pilot with the courage to do all that. On the other hand, the Army was in the market for a subsonic aircraft that could be used for reconnaissance as well as general-purpose troop transport across various terrains. Both branches were looking for an aircraft that could fulfill these requirements with a low production cost, obviously. This was something the project promised to deliver, since its radially symmetric design would allow for the repetition of identical sections during aircraft manufacturing, significantly reducing production costs. In 1954, the partnership with the American government began with the Air Force, which contributed $784,000 to the project with the six jet engines. This was the MX-1794 project. Seeing the interest from the American military, Avro Canada also increased its funding and contributed $2.5 million to the project the following year. The program seemed promising, and for a brief period, it appeared perfectly possible for the United States to become the first nation on the planet to start operating combat flying saucers. However, as soon as the tests began, problems started to arise. For testing purposes, a model of the aircraft with six engines was built in a building resembling a bunker. The goal was to test various project concepts and provide the Air Force with data demonstrating the feasibility of the concept. And the data came, but unfortunately for Frost, they weren't very favorable. The model showed that those six jet engines surrounding the pilot would be extremely noisy, generating a whopping 140 decibels of noise, and the temperatures, well, several components reached the fatigue limits of the metals used at the time. Let's just say it would be a red flying saucer in the sky. That's not all. The model also suffered from oil leaks that resulted in three fires. Even though it was housed in a bunker with reinforced cabins and bulletproof glass, the project personnel were afraid to conduct the tests. In one of the tests in 1956, the situation became so dangerous, with one of the jet engines operating completely out of control, that Frost himself decided to halt the tests and return to the drawing board. During the same period, the U.S. Air Force was becoming convinced that the supersonic flying saucer would not leave the ground, at least not in its entirety. Therefore, in 1958, the Air Force put the six-engine project on hold and transferred Frost to the Army, which joined the project to fund a smaller model with three engines. Two prototypes of the Avrocar were to be built, and it would continue to receive substantial funding from both military branches. These are the prototypes that appear in these videos. Finally, the saucer would leave the ground for the first time, but when it left the ground, it became so unstable that, well, you can see the pilot struggling to control the vehicle in most of the footage available. The concept remained the same, but now the aircraft featured three turbojet engines tangentially mounted on the central fan, called the turbo rotor. The airflow sucked in by the turbo rotor, along with the exhaust gases from the engines, was directed through ducts to the aircraft's edge, providing lift and propulsion. The aircraft had many ducts indeed. In this project version, an air duct was placed at the turbo rotor's exit to supply each of the engines. However, this approach led to some of the hot exhaust gases being re-ingested by the engines, resulting in power loss. This was changed in the subsequent version, which moved the engine air intakes upwards to these three points here. However, the aircraft's thrust still came from a turbulent mixture of the hot exhaust gases and the cold air sucked in by the turbo rotor. This resulted in reduced thrust, but the situation worsened when the Avrocar attempted to hover using the ground effect. The instability became so significant that it was like balancing a plate on the end of a rod for the pilots. But in this case, they were on top of the plate and had difficulty seeing the ground. This was due to how the ground effect interacted with the aircraft, 
As the aircraft moved away from the ground, the air cushion narrowed. This caused the aircraft to momentarily transition from a region without ground effect to one with ground effect at intermediate heights. At this time, if the aircraft tilted forward to move forward, it left this part fully sustained in the ground effect, while in the rear part, the effect disappeared. This led to a strong pitching moment towards the rear, without the support of the ground effect. And once this occurred and the rear portion approached the ground again, it would regain the lift, while the front would lose the ground effect. Thus, the Avricar would roll from side to side. One idea that emerged to improve the situation was to utilize the angular momentum of the turbo rotor to provide stabilization through the gyroscopic effect. In this scale model, you can see that the turbo rotor would directly act on the flight controls at the aircraft's edge. The controls themselves were also modified, replacing the fins around the aircraft with a very intelligent system called the focus control ring, which directed the thrust focus on the underside by displacing a ring. They also added new air vents on the underside to provide a central jet and stabilize the aircraft while it moved. These modifications helped considerably, but did not completely resolve the instability issues. What was missing crucially for this type of aircraft, and what they did not have at their disposal, were computerized controls. Speaking of problems, we can't forget the significant amount of energy lost due to friction of the gases in the duct system and turbo rotor feed a power that was lacking at the time of producing thrust as the aircraft rose above the ground effect. This was only discovered in practice when they accelerated the engines to full power but didn't take off. If they had directed the engine jets downward, as is done in the modern F-35 fighter, with fewer curves and ducts, much energy would have been saved. Countless changes were made, including the reintroduction of control fins and even the addition of a tail, but nothing could get the saucer off the ground despite numerous reports of flying saucers across the country. It's not mine. Over 10 years, Frost's dream shrank from a saucer that would fly at 3,045 miles per hour and an altitude of 20 miles to a saucer that flew at 31 miles per hour, three feet off the ground. Then, the inevitable happened. And in December 1961, after spending over $10 million on the program, the Pentagon canceled the project. But that's how it goes. Nowadays, inventions are made through extensive research and investment. And if you think the money spent on the project was wasted, you're mistaken. Many concepts and lessons learned were used in future projects, such as the British Harrier jump jet and the modern F-35, among others. Furthermore, its circular shape, although seemingly strange for an aircraft, is not far off from the shape used in reusable spacecraft. If you look at the Apollo capsule from below, it resembles a flying saucer. Now, what do you think about watching another video from the channel that will appear here? I bet you'll enjoy it. Thank you for your company, and until the next video.